Okay, sorry for the uh, delay. So apparently the Wi-Fi at the school, what the heck? Okay. Why Wi-Fi at the school really sucks that I have to always connect this iPad to the computer to share my screen, which is really sad. So, okay, so let's get started. Um, so today's lecture will be mostly about pre-trained language model tools, namely Hugging Face. So hopefully, okay, really weird. Did you hear that? Okay. All right, so we'll be mainly about Hugging Faces Transformers Library. It supports a lot of uh, pre-trained language model, including BERT. So, um, gosh. Okay, so I'm hearing some really weird sound. I'm not sure you're hearing the same thing, but um, yep. Hopefully, it doesn't happen again. Okay, so wait, was there some chat? Okay, so maybe it's coming from someone else. So please mute if you haven't. Okay, looks like it's okay now. All right. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea, to be honest. Okay, hopefully it's fine. I mean, even if it's if, the, if it continues, then it's fine. We'll just continue the lecture with the noise. Okay, so it will be mostly about the... It's really disrupting. Okay. Um... Let me see, maybe it's because of my iPad. Well, it was because of my iPad then. I'll just open the PDF on my on my computer. Okay, I don't think I have a lot of things to write down today, so Right. So sharing you share. OK, 
Okay, so hopefully everyone sees this. There we go. Okay. So today's outline will be, I'm gonna go through a few announcements. I don't think there is any new, just probably recap. And also I'll be recapping a few things that we learned about BERT last Wednesday, no, on Monday. And then I'll also talk about, um, yeah, so a few things that we talked about last Monday. And then we'll be doing more of a hands-on hands -on coding with the Hugging Face Transformers on Colab so that you, you know how to use it. And it's, I think it's, um, it's important to be able to use it well especially if you want to do assignment four. So um, that will be today's schedule. So same announcements. We have assignment four that's coming up today. It will be released tonight. And next Monday, we're going to give an introduction and tutorial with some Q and A's on the final project. And um, for the final project, it will be led by our TA, Myung. And the final project has two components. One is presentation. We're gonna use uh, Gather Town on both Monday and Wednesday class. These are the uh, classes right before the finals week. And you will have some time during finals week to finish your report, which will be four to eight pages long. So let's start with some recap on what we discussed last Monday. So we discussed what's, what the difference is between BERT and Transformer. So we know that Transformer was used for machine translation, which means it has encoder and decoder. And encoder has um, similar structure to decoder. They have very similar structures, but the difference was that the on the encoder side, you only have self-attention on the inputs, but on the decoder side, you are attending, you have also have another one more, one additional attention layer that's coming from decoder to encoder. And it's important to note that BERT only uses the encoder side of transformer. So I emphasize that BERT is not made to generate a sentence. That's a core difference between BERT and other models like GPT which is actually a language model that only uses decoder side. So that's like one key difference. And in, even in the encoder, there are a few differences. One is that BERT uses position embedding instead of a sinusoidal encoding. BERT uses larger model size than transformer. BERT has mask language model as the objective function for training. And BERT has um, a bit I would say different training scheme. So for the position embedding, we discussed that transformer uses sinusoidal encoder, which is very, um, which is uh, theoretically able to handle arbitrary length input because sinusoidal graphs never ends. So you can basically have a really uh, many number of uh, input tokens, even if during training, you haven't seen a lot, but then the problem is that this is more of a theoretical um, upper bound, but in practice, they don't really work well when the sequence length goes up. So in practice anyways, it's, it's actually probably correct to say that transformer, even if, it, even if it uses sinusoidal encoding, you will be only able to handle sequences that's as long that's the whose length is about the same as what you have observed during training. So it is unlikely that it's it's not it's un unlikely to expect that suppose you train transformer with say 50 words sentences, and then you cannot expect it to work really well with say 500 words during inference time. So um, there is where the the um, empirical uh, results is quite different from um, 
theoretical, I would say, upper bound. So that's what people have observed that, and that's why people have moved away from sinusoidal encoder because and if you, you can only handle the sequence length that's about the same as training time, then there is no reason to really use sinusoidal encoding. It's, it's more stable and also it's uh, also more intuitive to use embedding-based encoding, which BERT uses. So in this case, that the, each embedding in each position has its unique embedding. So it, it's different from the word embedding in that word embedding depends on what the word is, whereas position embedding depends on what the position is. And you basically just add these two embeddings to create the final embedding for each token. And we also discussed the BERT model size is bigger than transformer. Most notably, transformer uses six layers, whereas BERT uses up to 24 layers. And I, I forgot to discuss this too, but trans BERT has also the hidden size is larger too. It's going up to like 1024, whereas transformer is up to 512. Of course, it's, it's, this is like more of a trivial thing because um, transformer is just a very generic architecture. So um, it's not really too difficult to scale up. And BERT uses mask language model for training, whereas transformer uses decoder to generate sentence. And mask language model is not really language model because it's not able to generate a sentence. It's more of a, you mask a single token in the input and you try to guess what that word is by looking up the embedding that corresponds to the mask. So it's more accurate to say that BERT is more of a closed test if you have heard of what that is. And BERT training, unlike transformer, has fixed length of up to 512 and batch size is also up to 512. This was very large given the standard back then. People thought that batch size doesn't have to go up as many as, many as 512. There were some um, popular belief that there is no reason to go above 32. I think, um, I, I remember Jan Lukun said that, I think in his Facebook post like three years ago. So probably we can say it's um, not correct at the current, um, what we have observed up to now in the literature. And it needed 64 TPU chips to train, which is equivalent to 16 V100 GPUs barely and that's equivalent to a single djx station and this is this usually costs like a half million dollars so bird is not for everyone definitely you cannot really train with your uh, local desktop computer and they train this for four days with really high network bandwidth and this is really important because if you do not have high network bandwidth if your gradients have to go through your cpu and um, very slow network then it will be much slower than that. So in the modern like, large model paradigm, you cannot train a model within GPU. So the gradients have to be shared among GPUs, which means you have to have really fast connection between GPUs, direct connection that doesn't go through CPUs. And that's what's called, if you're using NVIDIA GPU like V100, then it's called NVLink and of course, probably other GPUs also have uh, their own names for this, but um, it's really important. It's like a very crucial for creating a large scale model. Um, so that was, that's up to what we discussed. And actually one more, um, before going into the, um, the hugging face tutorial and hands-on coding, I want to mention one more thing that it's very, very um, recent trend. When I say recent, I mean like a few days ago, like right after last lecture, for instance, that um, these days there are a few um, empirical evidences that convolution, convolutional neural networks can replace trans, uh, transformer too in certain cases, not every case though, but um, there was a paper that just got, pop, I think released a few days ago, were saying that, oh, you can use CNN, and the pre-train in the just same way as transformer was uh, used to pre-train a bird. So bird is bird because 
it's a bidirectional encoding of, I forgot what R was, but T is transformer. But you can create a BERC, which corresponds to BER of not transformer, but convolutional neural network, right? And if you, for instance, train a Burke, I don't think they call it Burke, but um, then the paper was saying that um, Burke can be as good as BERT in many language tasks. And that was, I think that's very uh, hot these days, I think on, on Twitter, because um, people thought that uh, Transformer is really the, um, where the Transformer brought the, the advances that we are seeing now. But we, we are also seeing some new perspective that maybe self-attention is not super necessary to make really good models. So I'm just giving you this perspective because um, as I teach you know, this class, a lot of things change. Um, sometimes you know, things change that basically just shatter the uh, foundation of the class. So um, I just wanted to be clear about that. And um, of course, uh, we cannot say that the CNN really replaces transformer because I think the paper was saying um, it doesn't really work well with the question answering. Um, one of a task that Bert showed really big performance gain. So maybe um, we can say that convolutional neural network can replace transformers for classification, uh, text classification maybe. And maybe it's not so true for other tasks, but um, anyways, um, such things are happening in the field. And um, it's very interesting you know, to see these advancements being made and new hypothesis and new beliefs, I think, are being proposed. But I think um, as a student, as a student who's taking this class, I think for now, we cannot, we don't really have to worry about that for now because I think transformer is good enough. But maybe in the next semester when I'm teaching this class, I might be saying that, okay, what's important is not transformer, but um, whatever the network is, so it has to be pre-trained and has to be big. So, um, yeah, in that if that happens, then yeah, it will be interesting really um, to see how really the people's beliefs evolve. And, and in fact, I mean, actually, that's what already have, have has happened um, when trans transformer was proposed because people were saying back then that RNNs, LSTMs, these networks are absolutely necessary to model language because they thought that language is 100% sequential information. That was the really strong belief and it was very not, um, I would say popular idea that some non, I mean, some paralyzable net, um, model can be as good as RNNs, but turns out that what Transformer kind of showed was um, it's not super necessary. So maybe another discovery happens soon. Okay, but um, so that's that. But uh, let's go. Let's come back to hugging face. So, in the last lecture, we discussed that hugging face is probably most popular library that are that NLP researchers are using to create um, transformer based or BERT based or some pre trained language model based models. And it's very easy to use. I think I show you very briefly how they can be um, as short as like 10 lines of code. Um, I'll be going a bit more details today. Um, and you will need to learn this for assignment four. And I think it will be important for you to learn how it kind of works uh, with um, today's tutorial with using Colab. So let's get into this hands-on coding. I'm gonna use Colab and I'll be referring to the Hugging Face documentation. So I'll start sharing another screen. So you hopefully you see the Colab and you have to connect to the collab first and I'll just use CPU version. Uh, mine is by the way, pro. So it might be a bit, a bit different compared to yours if you're not using pro. It's I think $10 a month. Uh, 
Um, so let's see if it works. Looks good. Okay. So if you go to into the documentation, I think the best place to start playing around with the the Hugging Faces library. It's called Transformers, by the way. Um, so if you want to import this, then you have to first install it. And then um, installation is quite simple. It's just pip install. So we're going to just do this. And there is actually CPU support only version two. So if you're just testing things really uh, simple, you don't, want, you don't want to download a lot of things, then uh, you might want to install this too. So I'll just use CPU. Um, actually, I'll use GPU version. Um, in that case, then you have to actually Hopefully you know this by now. You have to control the um, runtime type because by default it's uh, it doesn't use GPU. Um, sorry if you, you didn't know this until now, um, but you have to change this to GPU, and um, you basically save it, and you have to connect again. So works and you want to also see if um, the GPU is there. So it looks like P100 is allocated. If you use Colab Pro, sometimes they give you V100, which is more powerful than P100, but P100 is enough for today's lecture too. So let's try to first install this library. And you can just basically, whatever you run that doesn't have to, um, you know, basically you can just open a new process and install and just exit that process. You can use this exclamation mark and pip install um, transformers. So there you go, it just got installed. So that's great, you just finished your installation. Um, you don't really have to care about this if you're using uh, Colab, although you might sometimes want to install from source if you want to uh, optimize things. Okay, so installation is good. Um, so we're gonna really go through the um, a few use cases in, in, the, um, in, in um, Hugging Face Transformers. So, more recently, they are providing very, very um, immediate applications that you can use without any modification. For instance, um, I think I discussed this, um, that they, you can basically um, import some pipeline that already exists, like sentiment analysis. And the good thing about this is, that, as you see, you can import from um, just pipeline and then just initialize this and then you can just run this on your computer and then get the uh, um, the, get the uh, the results out so it's I think we can it's worth actually taking a look into this because it's I think more relatively new features though so though but um, and then you just um, say you just copy and paste this right? And you will see that it takes some time because it has to um, download a lot of different things, including the model itself. So you see it's quite large, right? 268 megabytes. That's basically corresponding to the parameters that's being used. I'm pretty sure this is using BERT on the backend or something similar. And then, mm, Okay, so that's great. You um, downloaded this, and then this enables you to just um, classify sentences as positive or negative really uh, easily. So um, if you just type in something like, this movie was really good, then probably it will say it's positive. But let's try other things like, um, Something like even my kid can 
uh, film like this movie in a few weeks. So it's apparently sarcastic comment and it says negative. So it's interesting, right? I mean, it's it knows that this is sarcastic. <laughs> So this is more of a, I think, um, something that probably you will not be using in your, um, I think, assignment four or final project, but um, it's, I'm showing you where this is going towards that they're trying to make this um, as a very, um, what do you call, like um, something that you can use off the shelf very easily, right? But uh, probably what you want to be really aware of, especially for your assignments is how you can use BERT to create a classifier and if you want to know how to do this, then you want to go into some uh, tutorials. That's, um, let me see. So I want to actually do this from the um, scratch. So just trying to figure out. So I'm gonna really go into one of the uh, tutorial examples. And let's start, start first with the sequence classification. So this is exactly what you did for your assignments one. Remember that? So we were doing sentiment classification and probably you create a model that can classify this kind of sentence. We're going to see how we can use BERT to create a model that can do the sentiment analysis, similar to probably what the um, hugging face is providing us. Okay, so, uh, but then I have to find, yeah, here we go. So I, I, I'm, I'm asking you to actually go through this tutorial um, after the lecture, that will be helpful for you too. But uh, so we're going to go over this part, which is uh, corresponding to creating um, the um, classification model. And it's actually very simple. So um, that's why I want to really um, show you how to do this. Um, and so as you see in this um, sentence, in first you first import tokenizer and the, uh, the it's called auto model for sequence classification. But what this class does for you is that you can import your the model that you want by putting the name here. So um, you can basically think of this class as a helper that allows you to download and also use the model that you name here. And um, as you see, we're using a model called BERT base case fine tune MRPC. So I'm going to interpret you what this means. So probably you know what BERT is. And base is just size of the model. So there are several sizes. Um, the smallest size is small or probably tiny. And base is middle size. And then there's large. In many cases, you will be using base because the, the, per, the accuracy difference between base and large is not, not too big. But bird base is small enough for you to train on your single GPU machine on Colab. So um, probably there won't be many cases that you'll be using large during this class, at least for the assignment. But of course, if you want to maximize your accuracy, then you wanna go up to bit large. And then case is just how you consider your characters. Um, so if it's uncased, then it means that you do not differentiate between uppercase and lowercase because um, Sometimes, for instance, A here is uppercase, right? But you might want to think of this as equivalent to lowercase a, so that you can have um, less number of vocab and you can have a uh, more equivalency between say, same words. But of course, sometimes you want it to be case because you want to convey, you want to utilize the meaning of uh, uppercase. And then it's called fine tuned MRPC because um, I told you that the BERT starts from non fine tuned model. It's basically a pre trained model. We, we talked about this in the, in the uh, on what uh, on Wednesday, last Wednesday's lecture, not last Wednesday, last Monday's lecture, and also 
uh, not last Monday, sorry. So uh, last, last, last week's Monday's lecture and the last Monday's lecture on the transfer learning. And we show that um, the best way to do transfer learning, learning is to fine tune. Now I'm not, I, I cannot, I'm sorry, so it's my mistake. I'm, I cannot say it's best way. I'm saying mo probably most popular way to do transfer learning is you pre-train and then you just bring that weight and then further train on your target task. So in the in the in BERT, you train this mass language model on large Wikipedia corpus, and you bring that transformers encoder to your target task and fine tune it on the target task, which is MRPC. You can think of this as just a classification task. So um, similar to sentiment analysis. So Basically, what this means is that you, you're using a model that was pre-trained on BERT-based case, and then it was fine-tuned on the, the task called MRPC. So at least it has been fine-tuned, so you don't have to further train again, right? And you bring this tokenizer. So let's, let's, let's first try to... Uh, take a look into what this tokenizer does. So we have to first, of course, import these two things, right? You know what Torch is. And let's put this into the uh, collab. So we are initializing tokenizer and this tokenizer is using this auto tokenizer class method from pre-train and we are basically downloading this model from the web that Hugging Face provides. Okay, so tokenizer download was pretty small, right? Because what tokenizer does is that it contains the vocab so that you can tokenize arbitrary sentence. And when I say vocab, you can think of this as uh, very similar to the BPE that we discussed. Do you remember? I think, which lecture was that? Um, I think. Here we go. So we discussed in lecture 10, how we, how we can create tokenizer with um, data-driven method. So uh, that's, the, that's the tokenizer that we're initializing. And it's, it's very similar to BP. It's actually WordPress though for BERT, but every other pretend language model uses BP method. And um, then, then if you use tokenizer to um, say tokenize a certain sentence, like hello world, actually this actually shows you the, the words with input IDs. So it's not super friendly, right? But you see that it's, um, has split this into a few words and you have token type IDs and attention mask that we did, we, we, did, we, we went over this last week, last Monday, right? Um, so if you want to tokenize this with um, words, then you have to put dot tokenize, then you will see that tokenize dot tokenize, tokenize this into hello world and exclamation mark. That's great, right? Um, so how about a bit, really weird sentence like this, what happens? This is an interesting thing that probably is not so familiar if you haven't seen Bert previously, right? So it's a very long arbitrary sentence that probably you haven't seen during training. So what Bert does is, or the Bert tokenizer does, because this is a very generic BP based tokenizer. What it does is that, um, it first puts at ask, which makes sense because ask is a very common word. And then it splits here. And because these two are actually together in the original sentence, you indicate that with this two, uh, two um, sharp mark. So it's a sharp, sharp, and D. So that this enables you to once you have tokenized this, you can recover the original sentence because if these two sharp marks exist, then you have to just append them together. 
but this if these two symbols don't don't exist then you have you have a space between them that's how you can differentiate between space and uh, non-space when you have tokenized this in the subword level and same thing happens in f but you also see that um, because er is such a common word these are put together and you might now wonder why this doesn't have too sharp and this doesn't have too sharp because there was no actually um, space here, right? But then shouldn't you have too sharp here? The, the reason is that uh, how BERT works is a bit different from the, the original BPE. So original BP considers the, I mean, the sentence level BP considers the uh, entire sentence as a one word and then tries to uh, tokenize that with the frequency space method. But then in the, BERT tokenization, which uses the Google's word piece, they first split the sentence into words, and then each word gets split into subword if necessary. So what BERT did was that looking at this sentence, it first split this into um, this, and there is this um, punctuation that it split this into one, and then There is CCV. And then another uh, semicolon and then ER. So that's the first step that the, um, the BERT tokenizer does, which is um, tokenize the sentence into words. And then use word piece, which is BP variant. We further uh, split each word into subwords, which is then here ASK. Sharp 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 D and sharp sharp F, right? And then the next word will be just semicolon, right? And the next word will be C, sharp sharp Z and sharp sharp V. And then another um, a semicolon and then um, ER, which is just a common word. And then after that, just concatenate these lists. Then the output will be exactly this. So after the tokenizer tokenized this sentence into these tokens, they map this into corresponding word IDs which you can obtain by the just, oh, sorry, tokenizer um, default function. So uh, in this case, um, probably the best way to do is So here's one more thing I want to discuss. So, okay, that's great. So tokenize or tokenize this into three words, hello world and exclamation mark. But why is input IDs one, two, three, four, five? This is because BERT has two special symbols that's coming before and after the input sentence. So um, this is easy to see if you actually reverse this input IDs into original token. So if you want to know how to do that, then um, you have to actually go into the documentation. And um, if you go into um, tokenizer here, where is it? Um, here, tokenizers from tokenizers. So if you go here, then you will see that there are a few use cases here. Wait, not this one. Uh, here we go, yeah. So if you go to tokenizer here, then you will see that there are a few methods and um, there is a convert IDs to tokens, right? So let's try this out, what happens? So we now know that the uh, input IDs um, is tokenizer string of input IDs. And then 
uh, for input ID in input IDs, we want to print tokenizer dot, what was it? Convert IDs to tokens. Actually, it's input is a list, so you don't, you don't have to use for loop. Um, print tokenizer. So what happens? Then you see hello world here, but you have two special symbols, CLS and SCP. So you can think of this as special symbols that Bird uses for uh, various purposes. So I can tell you what the purpose of um, both right now. So the, this SCP is there so that if you have more than one input, remember that in GPT, since GPT, if you have more than one input that you just concatenate them and then just make that into one sequence. So BERT does the same thing, but you want to really differentiate between those two inputs. So SCP enables you to easily differentiate between those two inputs. A CLS is here just to uh, use it if you're doing anything related to classification, which we'll see soon today in today's lecture. Um, so I think hopefully everyone understood up to this point. It's uh, basically uh, Transformers 101. So that's tokenizer. And we're gonna import this model, the same, you can just do the same thing here, right? And this will take some time because you will have to download the entire bird-based model that has been fine-tuned on MRPC. So you see that it's about 433 megabytes. There you go, you just download the model. And then um, we have a here, two classes. Because the MRPC is really classification between whether two sentences are paraphrases or not. So it's a bit different from the sentiment analysis, right? Because in sentiment analysis, you only have one input. But in the in the MRPC, which is the purpose is to determine if two sentences are um, paraphrases or not, you have two inputs, right? That's why the you need SCP to separate between those two. So you just basically just declare this just for your convenience here. And then um, we're gonna just have a sample sequences, sequence zero, sequence one, and sequence two, three, sequence two. So let's take a look at this. So if you take a look at this, then sequence zero says the company Hugging Face is based in New York City. Sequence one is the apples are essentially bad for your health. And second, sequence two is the Hugging Face's headquarters are situated in Manhattan. So technically, actually, sequence zero is not, um, I'm not sure. Can you say this is equivalent? Because I don't think Manhattan is equivalent to New York City, but let's say it is then you can say that sequence two and sequence zero are kind of paraphrases where sequence one has different meanings. So we want to see if the model can detect that too. And then um, we are now here creating the, um, the input data for the certain pair of sentences. And now you see that we use tokenizer, but we previously used tokenizer to just put one input string, right? But then now we are putting two. And let's say, let's see how this, what happens uh, without actually return tensors. So, and then let's try to do the same thing, right? What happens if we try to um, print this into IDs and tokens actually, convert this IDs to tokens and uh, paraphrase of input IDs. And you will see that it start with CLS, that's great. And you see that the company Hugging Face is based in New York City and you see SCP and you see the second sentence attached, concatenated, appended to the first sentence. And then you see another SCP. So the point here is that 
uh, from the perspective of BERT, if BERT sees one input sequence, then we just put one, just like how we did with this tokenizer here. Then you will just end with um, your one input and the SCP token. But if you put two sequences, then it will end with SCP again, but you will have SCP in the middle of the, those two sequence inputs. So that is this way, uh, we're using these special symbols, but uh, from the bird's perspective or from the uh, model's perspective, it's very simple because you still have one input. From the human's perspective, you have two inputs, sequence zero and sequence two, but from bird perspective, it's very simple, one input, right? So that gives you um, a lot of simplicity when you're modeling the architecture. Um, so I think we're gonna stop for a um, quick break, three minutes, and we're gonna come back at 325 and continue on the rest of the Hugging Face tutorial. So see you soon.
Okay, let's continue from where we left off. So now you see that how you can append two sequences and then tokenize them together so that it gives you it gives you this kind of format that you have SCP between those two inputs and also ends with SCP. And we have this return tensors equal PT and let's see what this actually changes. And basically it's just a helper fun function that enables you to transform these, uh, the native Python objects into PyTorch friendly objective objects so that you can easily put them into the PyTorch model. So it's uh, more of a help helper function that doesn't really change anything in the content. But for instance, if you tokenizer, um, if you do the same thing again with uh, return tensors equal to PT, and if you print this, You see that it's exactly the same as the tokenizer function, but difference is that instead of um, having uh, giving you this as a list, it's now in the PyTorch tensor. And you also see that it has one more dimension. This is because you need the batch size, batch size dimension. And also you see that um, the same thing happens with the token type IDs and attention mask, where you have one more dimension to account for the, the one additional dimension that corresponds to the batch size. But that's the only difference between putting this PT and not. So you can put this uh, also TF so that you also get um, TensorFlow friendly object objects. And if you don't put anything, then it's just native Python objects. We're gonna use PyTorch, so it will be PT here. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna create a same input for it, not paraphrase, so that we wanna see if the model can actually detect that correctly. And then here's the, um, really the core part of the um, hugging face model, which is you use this model and put this paraphrase, which is the tokenized tokenized um, tokens of uh, the sequence zero and sequence two. Um, you know that in Python, this two asterisk marks corresponds to expanding the, the dictionary into key values of uh, the parameters, parameters, I mean, function inputs. And then you apply this model on this paraphrase input. So let's first see what this model does. So. So for instance, um, I'm gonna actually just uh, call this output and print this. So we just apply this input to the model. And you see that this is a, just a, some classifier output that has loss. Of course, we don't have loss because we're not training. We have logits and um, there is some grad, grad function and hidden states and attentions. But um, what I wanna say here is that you only have logits because you imported this um, model for sequence classification. So it's because the BERT actually has um, this hidden states output because it's um, transformer encoder. So when you put tokens right into the BERT model, then you will have the same lengths of hidden states output coming from the last layer of the encoder, right? That will be available if we use a BERT model, which I'm gonna show you soon, but because this is a model that's coming from for the sequence classification, that's why these things are not available um, you only actually show, it only shows you these, um, these logits for convenience, of course. I mean, you can access that easily too for, with some um, parameters, but in this case, it only shows you the logits that has been, where each logic corresponds to either 
um, they're paraphrase or not. So in this case, if this score is high, then it means it's it's a paraphrase. And if this score is high, then it means they are not paraphrase. And of course, we put paraphrase as the input. So that's why our output is has a high score on the paraphrase and low score on the um, not paraphrase. What happens if we do the same thing well, with uh, not, not paraphrase? You see that now we see low number on the is paraphrase and high number, relatively higher number on not paraphrase. So we know that this input will, it, these two sequences are not probably paraphrase based on the model's prediction. And why then are they outputting logits instead of a probability? It, it's a, that's because during training, I think you did this in the assignment one. I'm not sure remembering correctly, but during training, it's much easier and much more numerically stable to play around with logits than the probability. When you're computing the loss, you will have to convert the probability again back to log space. And what that means is then logits get transform into probabilities, probabilistic distribution by, the, by exponentiating them. And then you're bringing that back into log space for the loss computation. So you're, you're applying exponentiation and the log uh, in uh, basically uh, with, uh, you're basically doing the exponentiation and, and then taking a log again, right? And this causes a lot of a numerical instability which is very not desirable when you're doing neural network computation. So that's why they're providing the logics directly. And probably you have noticed this already, but when you're computing cross entropy, the default function expects that you put logits instead of the probability. And I want to emphasize this because I have seen some students think um, that the um, the, uh, the cross entropy function actually operates on the logits, but that's not true. Mathematically, cross entropy actually operates on the probabilistic space. And in fact, if your target label is one hot, which is the case for many, most tasks, then cross entropy is exactly equivalent to log probability of your, um, the, your test data which is equivalent to, of course, maximum likelihood estimation. So it's important to know that because there is some um, confusion that's happening due to how the code is done because of the numerical instability compared to how it's written in the math or in the papers. So in mathematically, people always say log P, right? Because that's what really we're trying to achieve, but um, numerically unstable computation so we just try to utilize logits. So it's um, um, something that probably was uh, something that you kind of already went over during your assignments, but wanted to emphasize that again in this um, tutorial. And then um, if you are training this model, then you will use this logits into your um, cross entropy with logits function. But of course, in this case, we're just inference. So we just do the argmax, right? Um, so that's what they do too. So, but actually they, they don't just do argmax, but they also actually compute the probability, right? But that's why they use softmax on top of this logits. So let's do this. Actually, we wanna, um, wait, let's just follow the same tutorial that we don't mess up with the variable names. And then we, we can just compute the probability corresponding to each logits. Okay, and then finally, we can just try to see what the output of this 
results and it's quite simple right um so we just um do so what this does is that for each class you just compute you just output what that class's probability is and we use this classes that was defined here just for your um, reference um, and we round that number from coming from here so if you do that, then we see that the uh, first input has a probability of 10% of being not paraphrased, but it's probably is paraphrased. And then we can do the same thing for the, um, the second result. And we see that it has higher probability of being not paraphrased. And it's not, you might wonder here then, where did you get these logits, right? Um, we know that, you know that the transformer encoder enables you to obtain the um, hidden states of each token, which are fully contextualized after the attention, but where do you get these logits? And it's exactly the point of BERT is that you obtain logits by just applying a simple linear layer on top of the CLS token. Because CLS token is also an input, so this will, there will be an um, output embedding that corresponds to CLS token. And then that will be um, say 512 or 1000, for the base, uh, BERT base will be 512 dimensions. And for BERT large, it will be 1024 dimensions. And you have that vector that corresponds to CLS. And then you just apply a uh, simple linear layer that maps that 1024 dimensions into two numbers. And these two numbers are exactly the logits that um, they output here. And of course, this was a uh, uh, fine tuned on the, the what was it? Um, this MRPC model. So um, th that's why it's working without any tra uh, training. And one more, one more thing I actually forgot to mention is that the example I just show you actually is operating on CPU. So you, you want to make it um, on GPU by calling CUDA method when you're initializing the model. So what that means is then when you have the model, um, where is it? This was all computed on CPU. So if you want to do this on GPU, then um, you have to actually um, wait, where is it? Here we go. So actually, if you just say model CUDA is model that CUDA, then you just load this on CUDA. So it's taking some time, put this on the model, on the CUDA, right? And once you put your model on GPU, then you, you also have to put your inputs on GPU too. So what that means is then, actually I'll just move this to bottom. Then um, after you have done this, then what you have to do is when you are using this model, which is here, you cannot, just run this because this will not work. So it says that input and output and index must be on the current device. So I, I think you already know this probably when you did assignment one or two, but in case you haven't, uh, you haven't realized this, you actually have to also um, really put everything into CUDA. So um, this will be, a bit more complicated, but uh, paraphrase CUDA is equal to uh, key val dot CUDA or key val in um, paraphrase dot items. And then you basically this way you put every value in this paraphrase dictionary in on GPU and then you just use this so that you can actually obtain this on GPU, and this will be on GPU too. 
you actually print this out, then you will see that this is on GPU by looking up device here. It says it's CUDA zero, which is on the first GPU on the, in the, mach on the machine. So um, that was a very quick tutorial how hugging face transformers work, but we use this uh, pre-trained um, BERT. So on your assignments, what I'm gonna ask you to do is that um, you will need to fine tune your model yourself, starting, starting from um, pre-trained language model. So originally I was thinking about actually assigning you um, uh, some generation model, but because the class has been delayed a bit, I mean, this class schedule has been delayed a bit. And I, I think also it, it's probably better for you to actually just um, do something that's more relevant to your final project, unless you're working on your own project. So I'll be asking you to use BERT to fine tune models. And you'll be basically just repeating what you did in uh, your assignment one and two, but with BERT. So now you will see how easy, easy it is to actually do your assignments if you use pretty language model and also how good that is. You can achieve much higher accuracy with the same data set. And it's good for us because we actually, if you remember, um, we actually used Hugging Face's um, data set library to do assignment one and two. So it's much easier to compare on your side too. We're using same data set, but different models. Um, we're, now this time we're using bird based models. So uh, before we end our lecture today, I'll be going through a bit more about how you can um, do a similar thing on the, uh, the question answering. So let's take a look at this. I'm not gonna use the, um, the notebook, but I'll probably just go through the code here so that you know what I'm talking about. So let's see, we can now interpret this much easier. So we do a similar thing, but now we have auto model for, for question answering, not sequence classification. So up there we were doing sequence classification, right? But now we're doing question answering. And then you do the same thing for tokenizer. It just was fine tuned with a different data set. And it says BERT large uncased whole word masking. That's uh, actually just a variant of BERT. You, you don't really have to care about that much. This, this can be just ignored for now. And then um, you just use the same model. And then you have this text, which is a uh, Wikipedia like text, right? Transformers provides general purpose architecture, blah, blah, blah. And you have a uh, two questions or three questions. How many pretend models are available in transformers? What does transformers provide? And transformers provide interoperability, interoperability between with, with, which, frame, with, which frameworks. And then you just go through each question. Each question is an input. And um, you create your input by concatenating your each question with the, the context. That's exactly the same thing as what you did with the MRPC data set, question text, and you add special tokens. Actually, um, it, just say, it's, it just means that, um, I'll show you what this means actually. So if you put add special tokens, um, where is it? So we, it's equivalent to this, right? But, um, we, we want to rerun this, but with the special tokens. If you do this, you will see that it's actually exactly the same. CLS, SCP, and SCP. If you put this to false, You don't see any CLS, SCP, or um, SCP at the end too, right? So basically the true is a default and then you can put false so that you don't want to, if you don't want to put the special tokens. So yeah, it's not really super necessary to put this here. And we do the same thing, right? We just basically um, take a look into the input list, input IDs and um, 
I mean, actually this is for the later use, but uh, you just basically put this input into the model in the same way and you have this output. And now, because this is a question answering BERT, you have two kinds of logits, which is start logits and end logits. You remember that we did this in the assignment too, and you have this scores, and we just uh, find out what the argmax is. And once you found the argmax, which is your uh, likely starting point of your answer, and also the end, but you put plus one here because um, you want to, uh, when you're doing the uh, substring or sublist, it, it's exclusive on the, the, the second end position, right? So that's why you're plusing one. And then your answer is simply, you first, um, you have your input IDs and then you just take the IDs from answer start to, from answer start to answer end. And then, um, you use this input IDs and we remember we did this convert IDs to tokens and then just um, we convert this token into strings. What this does is just basically take care of those sharp, sharp things so that it can be all attached to into one. And then just print it out. So um, I'll just give you really one quick reason why actually before ending today's class, why, why this whole word masking is here. So um, I think it's worth mentioning actually. So if you don't put this whole, whole word masking, then what happens is then you basically take, you look into the subwords. And if you look into subwords, then this process becomes very complicated. Where it is, where is it? Because this might just, you know, um, what, what if we're basically, we're selecting the subspan of the context as the answer, right? But then what if the subspan start with sharp, sharp? And it's really weird because the sharp, sharp means that it has to be trailed by, uh, has to come after some word, but because of the, um, the model's error, then you're starting with sharp, sharp, which is not good thing. So. It's much simpler if you do everything in whole word, but then this will, of course, in many cases, degrade your performance. But, but then for the uh, purpose of the, um, the tutorial here, then we're, we were using whole word so that you can actually um, do this really simple with very simple way of recovering the answer. This can be more difficult if you actually consider subwords. So as you see, then you get that, you get the answer correct pretty easily. How many pre-trained models? Over 32. What does transformers provide? General purpose architectures. And you also see why this happens. Because it was tokenized in the first place by the word tokenizer. And uh, uh, you also get the, question, the answer to the question correct, but you also again see that the because of the punctuation, this gets space in the middle too. So these are the uh, more of a, I would say, um, hiccups that this simplification causes. So in in the model that um, the Bert did for achieving the state of the art on squat leaderboard, how you obtain the answer is really complicated compared to this. It's very like, there, there, there are a lot of uh, engineering that goes into obtaining the, uh, the best answer from the, this uh, answer start and end probability distributions that the model outputs. But um, so I think I went through everything you need to know. I mean, not of course everything, but that everything that I wanted you to know before you start your assignment, you will probably, but you will definitely need to uh, learn more than what I told you today to do your assignments by looking up documentation, but I'll try to make it clear where you look up and how you study uh, Hugging Face documentation. But at the end, you will be able to create your own classification and the question answering model with BERT um, and with much higher accuracy than what you did on assignment one and two. So this will be easier assignment than one and two, although you're doing the both things at the same time. So don't worry too much about it. Okay, so I think that's it for today's lecture. So thank you everyone.
we'll see on next Monday. And uh, on next Monday, we'll be discussing open domain question answering, which will be your final project. If you ha uh, haven't asked me um, about your own final project yet, then please do that as soon as possible. But otherwise, you'll be working on this for your final project. And uh, uh, Myung will give a brief tutorial how you can approach this problem. Thank you.